Hello, everyone. This week on the Eldritch Lorecast, we bring on Kelly McLaughlin and Dr. Montgomery Martin, the Dungeon Dudes, to talk about Sebastian Crow's Guide to Drakenheim in its final days on Kickstarter. All that and more, right now. Hello, I'm Ben Byrne, and welcome to this week's episode of the Eldritch Lorecast. Hey, did I fool you? No, I'm James Hake, recording from Ben Burns Recording Studio with two other unusual uh, appearances here on the Eldritch Lorecast. Uh, That would be Dr. Montgomery Martin and Kelly McLaughlin, the Dungeon Dudes. Uh, coming to you from Canada, uh, and Dale Kingsmill, also from the east coast of Australia, here uh, joining I you were us. Going to say also from Canada. <laughs> also from Canada. <laughs> it's the access. Surprise. We can tell. <laughs> mm. um, here on a very fun episode of the Eldritch Lorecast, our fiftieth episode to be precise. Oh, I almost feel wow. a little bit sad that Ben can't be here for the anniversary of it all. Um, but he's, he's a little bit tied up right now. Oh, wink, 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 wink. <laughs> <laughs> for the fiftieth episode, we're trying a brand new lineup, and you can tell us how it goes. And yeah, I don't know. send your opinions about uh, how this lineup for the Eldritch Lorecast is to podcast at ghostfiregaming dot com, along with any questions you'd like us to answer in future episodes. How's that for a plug? Um, What has just happened in a fun little corner of the internet is there is a Monty Python RPG now on Kickstarter. Monty Python's co-curricular medieval reenactment program. Um, Fun (laughs) RPG. Very cool. I recommend you check it out. But what we're here to talk about today is uh, Dale Kingsmill. If you were to make a Monty Python RPG of your own, what's one thing that you would uh, have to put in it. This can be mechanics, it can be theme, genre, flavor, anything along those lines. You know what? I feel like there would have to be, I don't know what it would look like, but somewhere in there, there has to be a way of the number three becoming the number five. (laughs) Surely. (laughs) Every time you roll a three, it actually is a five. (laughs) That's really good. I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah, that was a that was a deep cut. I love it. Or every yeah, time good. it's a five, it's actually a three. You know what I'm getting at. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Monty, how about you? What's one thing you put in a Monty Python RPG? I think a module to do a swords and sandals crea- uh, creation set in the life of Brian. <laughs> yes. Oh That's a very good point because this very RPG is, point. it takes a very Monty Python and the Holy Grail yes. sort of bent with its medieval theme. Um, but yeah, to do it, to do it in their uh, pseudo, pseudo biblical times, oh, yeah. that would be with very fun. Just the, the, the wonderful scenes where you can have the argument over the name of what your organization is, is called and mm-hmm. argue with Roman soldiers over the correct, the correct way to write your graffiti in Ro- in, in Latin. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kelly McLaughlin, how about you? What would you put in a Monty Python RPG? All right. So your travel pace is actually determined by the physical adequacy in which you can create the sounds of horse clopping. I don't expect you to have... Uh, coconut shells yes. next to you, but you have to like find something like your your dice and be able to be like, and like the better you can do it, <laughs> pretty the good. faster your travel pace is. I like it. And if you happen to have coconut shells, then I mean, mm. maybe you'll you're, go faster. You're good. If you have coconut shells, you travel at maximum travel pace. No penalties. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, I would say in combat, As long as you loudly declare, I'm invincible, there is no way to be reduced to zero hit points. (laughs) Incredible. We got a great suggestion in chat there from uh, from Cosmic Postman saying that you should have a familiar that is a dead parrot, but it's maxed out bluff. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Oh, fantastic. Holy hand grenade needs to be in there. Of course. Bunny. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. And what are some exhaustive of the- explanations for the land speed of African versus, uh, uh, in, uh, is it African or what's the other? Swallow? Or European swallows. European, European swallows, yeah. yes. Along with their carrying capacity and, and 
Oh, have, all have we all staff. watched Monty Python? Is that is that clear? Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Understand our knowledge of pop culture references. Yeah. <laughs> Understand it. Actually, what I'd really love to see is I would love to see some some allusion to the like the modern sketches in in Flying Circus, where you know <laughs> one of my favorite Monty Python bits of all time is the uh, is the silly job interview where John Cleese is doing everything to to antagonize his job applicant and this you know poor poor Graham Chapman or whoever is just like oh I don't think I'm doing very well at all as John Cleese is like <laughs> good night <laughs> ding 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 I think the funniest thing is that most D and D campaigns end up as Monty Python campaigns anyway so yes right away <laughs> yeah so when you're using that as the baseline what oh, do you yeah. end up with. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A very serious campaign. <laughs> like the darkest, <laughs> most serious, grave campaigns you have ever Gritty, played. Gritty, yeah. Blood covered. Yeah. <laughs> You actually you end up with Grim Hollow. That's mm. yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> speaking of speaking of a little bit of darkness, speaking of a little bit of that that deep resonant flavor, um we are now in the home stretch for uh, the Dungeon Dudes and Ghost Fair Gaming's Kickstarter campaign for Sebastian Crow's Guide to Drakenheim. Um, if you were a fan of Drakenheim, Dungeons of Drakenheim, and the Dungeon Dudes to begin with, you already know what we're talking about today. But in case you aren't, um, I'd like to talk with both of you, Dungeon Dudes, for a little bit, and and Dale as well, of course, uh, about the the realms of Drakenheim. So, Monty, I, I toss it to you first. What is Drakenheim? Well, Drakenheim, quite specifically, is the ruined capital of the nation of Westmar, which was destroyed by a mysterious meteor shower roughly 15 years before our campaign begins. The world of Drakenheim is thus a setting of both dark fantasy, political intrigue, cast against this looming threat of cosmic terror that encroaches against it. So there's a bit the the world of Drakenheim as a, as a whole kind of has both this this dual focus of a uh, really faction driven conflict of squabbling mortals trying to come out on top of one another over over who will have the power to make these decisions in the meantime while wrestling with the madness and terror that is that has come from these eldritch forces that are that are slowly seeping into their world and so the question then becomes who will be the allies and who will be the enemies that can actually stand against this? Because unfortunately this is a world where you will not be uniting the factions. The fundamental differences in the people that inhabit this world really echo, um, speak to the kind of difficulties that human beings often face in finding ways to find common ground and work together even when we are dealing with catastrophic circumstances. So the setting has a little bit of cynicism to it, but it makes for some fun decision-making and a really great web of allies and enemies as the players really get to drive the political outcomes and decide. You know, in in many campaigns, the the question often is, are the heroes going to save the world? But for Drakenheim, the question often is, what is the world going to look like after the heroes save it? Ooh, that's a juicy question. Ooh, and I can yeah. imagine uh, there have been no recent events lately that might have inspired a sort of cynicism, the ability for <laughs> otherwise good-hearted people to come together for a common cause. It's too real. It's too real. Come on. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, we kind of... <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. I, I, I laugh it, it, a little bit. Uh, we got a comment here and there of people being like, I love your show so much. It's great to escape. Thank you for not being too like political or making any statements in your show. And I'm like, oh, there's statements. Uh, They're they're there. You're missing the statements? Uh, (laughs) When we finished the first season of the show back in 2018, 2019, people used to leave comments on the show being like, why can't all these people just set set aside their differences and work together? And for some reason, ever since 2020, we stopped getting those comments. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Speaking yeah. of the show, dudes, um, tell us a little bit about the show, because I think there will be some viewers here on this episode of the, of the lore cast who've uh, never seen the show and might want to know, do I need to see the show uh, in order to get into this book? And uh, do I want to get into the show? What's it about? 
Well, I think what's important is that, first of all, you do not need to be a fan of the show to uh, get the book. If you like, well, let's, let's state the name of the show real quick. The name of the show, there are three seasons currently. Dungeons of Drakenheim is season one. Shadows of Drakenheim is season two. And Fate of Drakenheim is season three. Mm-hmm. And oh, our oh. first Kickstarter was Dungeons of Drakenheim, very much inspired by season one of our show as a campaign module uh, that takes place in the ruined city of Drakenheim. Sebastian Crow's Guide to Drakenheim kind of explores more of the theme seen in Shadows and Fate. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but the show, you don't have to watch the show to be into the book. As a matter of fact, if you watch the show, there might be some spoilers, but also the beautiful thing about when we approached the campaign and writing it, A lot of people, as Monty said, it's very much a faction intrigue about which factions are you going to ally with and which are going to become your enemies. What's beautiful is that when people watch the show, some people agree with the characters' choices. Some people strongly disagree with them. They're like, why did you turn on that faction? Why are you doing this? I would have joined the Queen of Thieves. I would have joined the Silver Order. Um, And when you actually play through the campaign presented in the book, you get to make your own choices. So because of that, even if you watch the show, you can still play a completely different campaign. Mm -hmm. The show follows the adventures of three characters at first. So in season one, we follow the characters of Sebastian Crow, Pluto Jackson, and Veo Senya. One is a meandering mage, uh, Sebastian Crow, a uh, streetwise survivor, Feo Senya, and a brash prince of Caspia, Pluto Jackson, who all come together to uh, for their own gains in the city of Drakenheim and in the process get caught up in the rivalry between the factions and turn into sort of the heroes of the city, so to speak. Some people don't see them as heroes. That's okay. Um, and they have to make the choices along the way on what they're going to do with the eldritch crystals known as delirium, which factions they're going to align with and uh, try to put an end to the horrors of Drakenheim. Uh, one of the other interesting uh, pieces of the show is during the crash of the meteor into the capital city, the royal line was broken. And so a civil war broke out for 15 years and nobody knows who's supposed to take the throne of Westamar. The player characters become the centerpiece of the decisions for who's going to claim the throne and all of that as well. And they have to make choices along that path as well. So you have a lot of political intrigue, a lot of cosmic horror, a lot of terrible choices. In season two, we join three new characters on the outskirts of civilization in Westamar who are witnessing the spreading darkness caused by Drakenheim because now the darkness has spread beyond the walls of the city. And we join um, Wilhelm Wolfsbane, Rudy Whitaker and Wrath. Uh, who All are- of these names are so good. Just a sidebar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and they're touring around the outskirts of Westamar solving issues caused by delirium. And eventually, this is where we come to season three, the two groups have to converge and now are making choices together, uh, which is really fun because as a player, I get to play two different characters depending on the episode and on rare occasions, both at the same time, uh, which is (laughs) really a challenge, but I can't really complain (laughs) because Monty plays 20 characters at once. So. Uh, but that's that's the three seasons. We're currently in the midst of season three, uh, so we don't know where it ends yet. But that's the big decisions are happening. Uh, we're coming to the forefront of the faction intrigue and the political decisions, and what's going to be done with Delirium is all coming to a head in season three. And when other people pick up this book from the Kickstarter campaign, they may deal with Delirium in a completely different manner than you have on the show. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. And with Sebastian Crow's Guide to Drakenheim as well, um, Sebastian Crow's Guide is meant to be complementary to Dungeons of the Drakenheim, but not a requirement. So the book presents new player character options, the new apothecary base class as well, new subclasses for every class, and then a gazetteer to the wider world around the city of Drakenheim. In Dungeons of the Drakenheim, it is a very focused adventure that one of the actual notes that we talk about in the 
outset at the outset is that when you're arranging session zero, the dungeon master and the players actually come to an agreement that says the campaign does not leave the immediate environs of the ruined city and the nearby mm-hmm. village. It's all set there. And so a lot of people asked us during the first Kickstarter campaign, are you going to do new player options? And are you going to give us lore and a guide to the wider world? So with Sebastian Crow's Guide to Drakenheim, a large part of the book is also the Gazetteer that provides inspiration for new adventures, player character origins, um, backstories, various adventure hooks as, as well about the wider world and all the other political factions that build on top of the conflict that kind of where if Drakenheim is kind of like the eye of the storm of these looming conflicts that have been brewing in the world for a long time. The people asked, and you said emphatically, yes. <laughs> we, we, we made even more than I think people were asking for, which is something I'm very excited about, is in Sebastian Crow's Di- Guide to Drakenheim, we've talked about Drakenheim, the capital of Westmar. We've talked about the nation of Westmar. But two other things that constantly come up in the show is the nation of Caspia, who's full of like brash warriors trying to gain renown, and uh, they're great warriors, uh, constantly known for monster slaying muscles and all sorts of things. And then you have the nation of Illyria, which is a very religious nation uh, who founded the, uh, the sacred flame, the religion of the sacred flame, which is a prominent religion in our setting. So we get a lot of questions about these places. So in Sebastian Crows, the further you move away from Drakenheim, the less the book becomes about delirium And it starts to talk about the other politics and other people of the world. We go even further than that in this book and explore uh, places that we've only mentioned in a sentence or two in the show. The Isles of Skye, uh, the Jungles of Tyrene, the Eastern Vales, the the Northern Region of Netherwind. Uh, There's so many new nations and places that you could pick up Sebastian Crow's Guide to Drakenheim, say, I don't even like cosmic horror. And do an entire <laughs> campaign set in Caspia, where the upcoming kings moot, which is how Caspia decides their high king. And there's six houses in Caspia that are all rivals to each other. And they're always trying to bid on, and they have a big contest every 10 years. Whoever wins the most votes in the contest becomes the high king for the next decade. So you could do a whole campaign where you're just like, I want to be, the whole party wants to be of one house of Caspia and we want to be trying to win the king's moot. Now you're not even worried about the Eldritch monsters pouring out of Drakenheim. You're just worried about the king's moot and Caspia. And our book presents enough lore and adventures and ideas. It's not an adventure book, but it's full of ideas for a DM to pick up, read through it and inspire new adventures throughout the full world. And if you're a player and you're reading it, if you want your character to be from Caspia or from Illyria or from the jungle nation of Tyrene, you can read those sections and it's going to inspire so much role play potential in the characters that you could bring to a Drakenheim campaign. And if you're playing Dungeons of Drakenheim and your characters are like, we want to go to Caspia for gaining allies. Now, rather than saying you have to stay in the city with Sebastian Crows, you'd be able to say, all right, let's do it and move past the walls. Extremely cool. Speaking of what's inside Sebastian Crow's Guide to Drakenheim, Monty, I want to pose a question to you. What is your favorite new part of this book? Hmm. We've talked a little bit about the new alchemist James, class. I'm going to need you to redo that segue and make it make less sense, please. <laughs> If you could. Uh, speaking of six noble houses, I <laughs> want to know, Monty, what do you think the most noble part of this book is? There it is. That's the <laughs> <No>. Ben way. <laughs> um, yeah, Monty, so plenty of new stuff in this book. Uh, new subclasses, I think, for basically every class uh, in the 5e rules, plus your brand new alchemist class. Um, those are plenty of things to get excited for along with all of these nations and, and factions and politicking that Kelly has been talking about. Mm. But if it were up to you, Monty, if it were up to only you, the one part of this book that you would save forever, what would it be? Ooh, you know, I, I'm really proud of what Kelly and I have created with the apothecary class, but as part of that, we also got to design a bunch of spells mm. and there's something about making new spells for D and D that is just so much fun. 
um, and really, really enjoyable because you kind of get to spells are kind of like the cheat codes that players get to break the <laughs> rules of D and D. And so it it really feels like giving a lot of fun new options in that respect. And I think that Kelly and I designed almost uh, over forty, 40? Ma- yeah, new spells. We 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 started with the goal of doing, I think, three spells of every spell level. Um, things got shuffled around in play testing uh, because we were like, oh, the best way to fix the spell is to not make it a fifth level spell, but make it a sixth level spell and vice mm. versa. Um, but the but creating a new bunch of new spells, because with the apothecary, one of the things that we felt we had to address is the apothecary is an arcane occult doctor. And part of capturing the flavor for that, that we wanted to do with their spell casting capabilities was giving them an arsenal of spells that felt appropriate for that type of magic and the feeling we wanted to create. And so we wanted to create new spells that dealt with poison, acid, the body, corruption, diseases, um, and a couple new spins on sort of healing and restorative magic as well. And so getting to iterate on those things and and explore newer ideas and create some more fun spells was really, really enjoyable. All the way from making like very simple cantrips, um, like our poison needle cantrip that um, inca- that incapacitates targets reduced to zero hit points rather than slaying them outright versus, you know, we have a very high ninth level spell that we're very curious to see where we can go in play testing. Cause our question with it was, was what is the most damage a single target? How much damage can you get away with for a ninth level spell that targets one enemy that requires an attack roll that, um, does just straight up damage to one target at melee range Hmm. and so what what was the limit that we could push there with with creating like a spell that felt like that that captured that kind of like the doctor who can harm and heal idea Hmm. um and so that was a really fun process creating the spells and i think that um that's a, a cool kind of added part of that also the contaminated spells that are spells that use delirium as a component which where we would take an existing spell in the core rules and contaminate it and make it a mutated powerful version of that spell but with the cost of taking on eldritch contamination and having that risk there so that that whole contamination sort of spell system i really really enjoy it and find it's a lot of fun so okay, I I love when Monty goes first because I get time to think about my answer. So yeah, uh, so I definitely think my favorite part of this whole book. I I, I don't want to dismiss the lore. I had so much fun writing the lore, but I think the poster child for this book is the apothecary class. And as much as Monty's talking about the spells, um, we've definitely we both are obviously fans of the apothecary. The apothecary is something that we started working on four years ago um, when we just felt like there's no doctor in D and D the only real heal healers are mostly associated with uh, religion in the world of D and D. And we just wanted like a gritty old timey doctor uh, you know, one of those crazy doctor who's, who's just like, I don't know, we'll inject you with leeches or something and it will save you. Um, like just <laughs> that, that wild, old timey doctor that when, when like medicine was kind of freaky and bordering on what people consider magic. And that's kind of where we dial the fantasy up is like in our world, it's both science and magic combined. And um, my favorite thing though, to, to branch out from that is actually the six subclasses that we were able to make. The subclasses six. went through. Yeah. So originally we were going to do three in the book, but Monty and I had, six ideas and we were able to flesh all of them out at first i remember monty had written down six names and he sent them to me and he's like i don't know if we have ideas for all six of these but i like these names and i was like oh no i i will i will make sure we have ideas for all six of these um because i love them too we got okay i'm gonna yeah i should be able to do this the alienist the pathogenist the mutagenist the chemist, the exorcist, and the reanimator. Hey. There we go. Um, You did it. And each one takes the apothecary in a completely unique direction 
And I love all six of them so dearly. Um, you can kind of build your apothecary to fit so many different party roles. And Dale was actually part of a one shot with us, along with Ben, where we played three different apothecary subclasses. And it kind of felt like we were able to create a dynamic party doing that. And I'm just so proud of these six subclasses. They all sound so cool. And in my play testing, I mean, I, I say that like I didn't write them, but I, I'm, I don't know. I'm allowed to think they sound cool. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, I, in play testing them, it's just like, it's been really fun to see, like, you know, when I'm writing down ideas, it's like, uh, this, this hopefully looks cool when it's actually in play. But then in the play test to actually see it in play and be like, oh, it is as cool as I thought it was going to be um, has just been, I, I don't know. I, the apothecary coming to life has been a four year journey for us. And from me walking into like Monty's house one day, I remember me being like, I want to make a plague doctor class. And Monty being like, no, there's too many plague doctors. That's a terrible idea. And me being like, you're <laughs> right. I guess there are too many plague doctors, but I like the image. And then Monty, like a day later was like, what if we took that idea and changed it? What if it was just the apothecary? And I'm like, ah, oh, okay, but I still want to play a plague doctor. And he's like, what if we called it a pathogenist and removed the mask and made it slightly different? And I was like, the okay. You have subclasses. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and then from there, we were like, what else could an apothecary be? And then we came up with all these different, and like from there, just like from my initial, I want to play a plague doctor to what it is now is four years yeah. of iteration. And it changed and changed and changed. And now it's grown into something, uh, in my opinion, unique and beautiful that i'm just so proud of yeah and being able to really draw on the inspiration and find like the stories like obviously herbert west reanimator is a clear inspiration um but so is um victor the victor frankenstein jekyll and hyde but then as we continued to work with it we started to look at oh doctor is the doctor is a very common fictional trope in a lot of storytelling like you have um and especially as soon as you step outside of fantasy and into more investigative type fiction, so um, and or even science fiction in particular, because you have your Dana Scullies and your Doctor Crushers and your Bones and uh, uh, all the these sort of characters that you can channel and bring in that that idea of the intelligent medical doctor, but then play with that occult sort of readiness that the medical profession brings into it. Uh, there was a wonderful podcast that I listened to for a lot of the research called Sawbones. Mm. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Good name. Yeah. Yeah. And just like, you're like, people have weird ideas. Like people have had weird <laughs> ideas about the human body, how it works. And, and the, the story of coming to understand how our bodies work has been infused with so much uh, magic and, weird occult thinking over the course of human history and across human societies that it it feels like such a natural fit and a real nice archetype to carve out to be something playable in our in our games of the, uh, our role playing games and particularly because it, the the history of it has been quite dark and messy and yeah. full of grave robbing and the like you know um <laughs> just some some back alley autopsies here and there. Yeah. No big. I <laughs> genuinely, for anyone who who didn't see it, I know that the last time we had the Dungeon Dudes on, we talked a little bit about uh, the apothecary class. And then Ben and I went and got to play some of it, as as Kelly just mentioned. Uh, and you can go and see it on the Dungeon Dudes YouTube channel. And I think it, it was so much fun. It was genuinely so much fun. One of the earliest RPG characters I ever tried to make was in the Iron Kingdoms. I tried to make sort of an alchemist character who would concoct these strange sort of spell like grenades and it, it was just tricky and difficult to make it work and you handed me a subclass that was literally that and I got to play a chemist and there was a thing and I critted basically on a fireball it's just very good and fun so go and look it up if you haven't looked it up I think that the differences were so apparent between the three apothecary mm. subclasses that we played and it was it was just a, a really fun one shot to get into and I think it'll give people a really good idea of, of kind of yeah. the class and how it works Dale as a generally non-Drakenheimer um, 
But as someone who is very interested in world history and the many different cultures of the earth, uh, I think especially as far as like the classical antiquity goes, of which there are many, many uh, interesting doctors and physicians to speak of. Um, can you see uh, this apothecary class finding a home in games that draw more on on other mythologies than this sort of cosmic horror bent? I I can, absolutely. There's so the interesting thing is that this um this place between medicine and magic is so grounded in reality, right? And and it does pop up throughout mythologies. If you if you you know look into Egyptian mythology, Greek mythology, there are all these stories that kind of arise from this this meeting point between what is it that Pratchett says the place where the the falling angel meets the rising ape right mm. the place where it is kind of caught between the two um so you know in the story of Osiris just as an example when they're performing this ritual to bring the body back together and try and resurrect the this ultimate god it it is this halfway point between magic and between medicine you've got Thoth the god of of knowledge and Anubis, the god of death, working together to try and make this happen. Uh, and that's, I think, that's how, when you're playing it, the class felt to me. Um, and I, I don't know, it's just something that really captures my imagination that I think really, I think it, I think it works. I think it sits really comfortably into a lot of other um, sort of genres and moods as well. Uh, that's awesome to hear. Um, I think just because of the the breadth of genre that fifth edition is capable of holding within its within its space, that uh, to see a new class come out in fifth edition is always something that that uh, makes me a little bit nervous uh, because you know how how can a thing do something that hasn't been done before that isn't covered already by the uh, the twelve thirteen. Uh, core classes that Wizards has already published. And it seems to me like this apothecary has really found its home. Uh, I mean, especially even, with even six subclasses super, out of the gate. Six yeah. subclasses. Even in a in a super high fantasy setting, right? I think there's a lot of room for it in terms of um, the question of how does science keep up with this stuff? Mm. How does where where does science fit into a world that is so mm. empowered by magic? I think there's just so much to explore. Sebastian Crow's Guide to Drakenheim. Depending on when you're listening to this, if you're listening to us live, it has four days left on its Kickstarter campaign. If you're listening to us when this uh, first goes up on the very day it's released uh, in podcast form, it's got three days left. <gasps> and if you're listening to it in the future, I don't know what to tell you. But we are <laughs> in striking distance of our final one million dollar stretch goal in which virtual tabletop assets will be added to certain tiers uh, of the Kickstarter campaign. This is a truly incredible thing. Um, it's something that everyone at Ghostfire and uh, within the Dungeon Dudes sphere wants to do. Um, and we really need your help to make it happen. So go check out Sebastian Crow's Guide to Drakenheim. Check out the Apothecary class. Take a look at all of those uh, nations beyond the ruined city-state of Drakenheim and everything uh, that we've talked about today. Kay tells us, I have a language that I want my players to learn, something that people in their world have forgotten about, so there are no longer any teachers. They have a sample of the text they can try to decode, and I want to make a fun mini game for them to try and learn the language and decode the text. But I don't want it to just be something that one person sits down and solves or can just solve through a bunch of rolling. Is there a way that I can get my whole party involved in the challenge of decoding this script? So it looks like there's some sort of Rosetta Stone uh, situation that these characters need to unravel. My it's brain went to Kryptonian, and actually, now that you've said <laughs> Rosetta Stone, that that does make more sense. Um. No, no, no. Run with Kryptonian. I like Kryptonian. My my initial thought right away is like, there's so many. Uh, like, I use video. I play a lot of video games, so I always my brain jumps to that. Um, but there's so many video games where like you have to decipher a language and you find little pieces of it throughout. But but how I would flesh that out at an actual table with people is 
I would actually write the alphabet of this language out with symbols corresponding to actual letters and then let the players discover that in each player like if they discover ancient runes on like a stone tablet or as they're touring or touring around and finding pieces of this forgotten language uh that nobody nobody actually knows it anymore but um great movie to watch would be is it arrival i think arrival is all about oh, arrival language yes. um arrival is a beautiful movie about language um and it's sort of this process of having to like decipher symbols and you could hand the players like as they're as they're finding these pieces each player might get um a piece of paper that has a, a sim one symbol and one letter and then together they have to work to start to decipher the each time they find a tablet it has a bunch of symbols on it it has full sentences stories history of this forgotten time but each time they find it they each only get one letter so they can start to decipher it but maybe if they make an intelligence based check they discover two um and you could kind of feed it that way that like slowly through the campaign they actually are able to build the entire alphabet and then they can go back to the previous tablets they found and start to open up the history of this language of of wherever it came from and all of that that's that's my initial thought that's just me throwing an idea out there based on first thing that popped into my head one of the simpler ways and i say simple in big scare quotes here of of introducing a completely foreign language to players is to make it uh is make it script at least just a cipher for english um we don't have to go full tolkien here and construct a, an entire fictional language with grammar forms and so on in order to get uh to the you know the, the meat of the fantasy that we're trying to present here Dale, what do you think when it comes to when it comes to languages? When it comes to the the way that people have unearthed ancient languages uh, in our own history, do you think there's anything to be drawn from that from Rosetta Stone style situations? Uh, what comes to mind? I'm very Egyptian in my head today, which is unusual <laughs> for me. But the thing that immediately comes to mind is uh, when you're looking at things like hieroglyphs, right? There are certain, I should know the word for this. Someone in the comments or in the chat or wherever is going to know the word for this. And I'm, I apologize that I don't remember it off the top of my head. But um, when you see a set of hieroglyphs that are surrounded kind of by a, by a box or by a circle, it typically means that that is a name. It's a proper noun. It's someone's mm. name. And little tricks like that, I think, can be um, really fun to throw. It's nice when you're in a movie and someone's having to like... D sort of they're translating on the fly and they're like, ah, oh, this is a name. I can't, oh, what is this? You know, I, I figured out the verbs or, or something like that. <laughs> Just as kind of a first step is always fun. So, um, you know, giving that information, going, this is the name of such and such. And then even using that as a key for the cipher can be really fun. The other thing that comes to mind is not quite so um, sophisticated sounding as me bringing up hieroglyphs, but it did occur to me, what if it was, what if it was, um, you know, horrifying children's game hangman because that's something that everyone participates in they all take turns going okay we've got the word we know it's five letters long is this letter an a <laughs> no it's a hangman if you can find <laughs> in-game consequences in place of the hangman that would be fun that would be cool everyone take turns i i really like that <laughs> They get trapped in some magical contraption that, like, if they don't solve the words by, like, the time that it's... The walls are closing in and they have to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man, that's brutal. Twitch user Sagan Legenschlaf says to us, if you want each of them to be involved in working this out, you could have each of them locked in separate rooms in the dungeon. So they need to work out their own ciphers without the ability to share notes in character. I think that's mm -hmm. a good idea. I think it, uh, the one caveat I would present to that would be uh, it's entirely possible there will be players, not characters, but players, maybe characters, who uh, don't like this puzzle. <laughs> Mm. Um, the danger in D&D puzzles is uh, if if you don't like it, then you're just kind of sitting back and letting the people who do like it tackle it. And sometimes it's not a bad thing as long as it doesn't happen all the time, and especially as long as it's not just one person getting the entire you know spotlight for a whole hour of game time. You run the risk if you're, you know, forcing people to play your your puzzle game mm. uh, to kind of kind of leave the the non-puzzlers in the dust. 
I'm maybe I'm totally off my base on this and saying, but have you ever played that party game where everybody has a card taped to their forehead that has uh, a word mm-hmm. or a superhero or a fictional character on it? And the objective of the game is you don't know what you are. So you have to ask other people questions to figure out what your word or what your character is. There's something about that interaction that feels like deciphering a language. And so what if there was some sort of magical effect or something where like every player character had been given partial knowledge of the language by some spirit possesses them, a spirit of that ancient culture. Or maybe the Rosetta Stone is shattered and it like breaks into all of their minds or something like that. And then each of them has, they they have to work together to do this guessing game because the party game format inherently requires that incomplete thing. But then whatever's written on their cards on their head spells out a sentence that is like the master key to decipher the language. And then after that, they've learned the language. Or I'm thinking of other games. There's other board games that There's are a card these- game called Hanabi. Yes, you took it right mm-hmm. out of my mouth. Where you, you all, you don't have the information, but everyone else around you does. It's really, yeah, Hanabi, you, I was thinking of it. You, you said it, Dale. That's the one. And you could play a board game like this uh, or a language based board game and you, or, or hack it and use that as your puzzle. And that way there actually is an interactive component and all the players have to work together to solve it. Monty and Dale, I love that you hanabi the concept of the game Hanabi. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, you know, we're perfect. <laughs> we're, we're built for it. I mean, I, what I really like about yeah. this as well is like the crux of what we're getting at here, I think all of us, is that you're looking for mechanics that feel like deciphering something. And it doesn't mm-hmm. matter if it's a perfect one-to-one match with actually you know, uh, figuring out a language because we're not aiming for reality. We're aiming for verisimilitude. So if you just, if you just invoke that feeling mechanically of you are deciphering something, then at the end of that process, you can say you've earned Mm -hmm. it. You've deciphered the language and it feels right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got so excited by it. I just blurted it out, but I am really in love with the idea of using a narrative delineation uh, to single to mechanically single out one player. You were talking about the you know the the word on the forehead game in that game in real life. You know, uh, you cannot guess the word. You know, you can't see your own head. You kind of walk around and interview other people. I think there would be something to it if one person were singled out. Uh, I, I just blurted out, "Oh, possession." One person can uh, can speak the language. One person is the only uh, person who can understand the words on the forehead. But uh, even if, if, if it were done uh, another way, some way for the players to kind of interview one person who could only speak in a certain way, who could only say a certain type of word. Um, because that also, it, it kind of promotes one of the players into being your puzzle accomplice which uh, is an interesting role, re- role reversal, especially I think if there's a player in your group who isn't so keen on the idea of solving a puzzle, but could get into the spirit of a puzzle if they were, if they had the solution and got to kind of play on the other team in order to mm-hmm. help their friends reach the solution. I, I mean, I love that because I know what it's like to have, I, I have, I put puzzles in my games like, like, Puzzles in the sense of uh, deciphering puzzles, whenever I put them in my game, there's like two to three characters who are like, we love puzzles, we love riddles, let's go. And there's always one who's just like, "Eh, I'll just sit back and let them handle it. And uh, occasionally that player ends up on their phone and, you know, like that sort of thing. And it's just like, this is, that's a really cool way to be like, all right, player who I know ends up on their phone, let's go. We're a team now. And it's actually a really clever way of handling that. Speaking of players who end up on their phone, methods to speed up combat encounters to avoid player boredom. Derek oh. asks, in a Pathfinder 2nd Edition game I play in, I notice that the GM tends to tell us the DCs of checks and ACs of monsters ahead of our rolls to keep things moving smoothly. I DM 5th Edition for a large group and have started doing this for AOE spells to avoid going around the table, checking with each player individually to see if it's a pass or fail. 
What are your thoughts and experiences on telling the players the DCs of checks or ACs of monsters? Um, to me, this always reads as a way of hastening the combat experience. It's a, you know, you, you trade away a little bit of the mystique uh, of, of, ooh, what's the monster's AC to create a sort of a, a more, a more predictable combat experience, which I think can be a good thing in certain cases. Hmm. I am. Um... I tend, I, n- I never tell them, but I, again, I have a player, the, the riddle guy, I'm going to call him, uh, always when he lands his first hit, he'll like roll a 16 and I'll be like, hit. And he's like, and he'll announce to the table, he's like, oh, the creature has an AC of 16 or lower. And then the next person will get a 14 and, and miss. And they'll be like, the AC is 15 to 16. We know that now. And like, I don't have to say anything by like, by the end of the first round, they've discovered what the AC is. Mm-hmm. Um my one little piece of advice and i will admit some dms hate this so don't use this if you hate this and please don't hate me for liking this um i use uh the average damage as a dm i love using average damage criminal I'm sorry, but it makes my job so much faster at the table. Absolutely. Um, I roll my D20, I hit, I'm like eight damage. I roll my D, like depending on the monster, I'm just like, cool, eight damage. Cool. Like it just, my position at the table is so much faster. If you're a player at the table, if you have multiple attacks, roll both your D20s at the same time. Uh, Like just do it. Be like, I got a 16 and an 18. Cool. They both hit. You can roll all your damage dice at once. Uh, that's a great way to speed things up as you're, if you're a player. And if you're a DM and you're willing to use average damage, it cuts a lot of time out. Especially the reason why I use it is I am terrible at math. I <laughs> am a finger counter. It doesn't matter. If, if I have to roll 8d6 because eight creatures hit in combat and i'm sitting there like counting on my fingers i by the end of a round of combat i've added an extra five six minutes that i that disappears as soon as i do average damage this is the closest i've ever been to being sold on using average damage you all (laughs) saw me on that on that technically crit fireball that was a nightmare of counting (laughs) yeah i as a player i don't do it obviously because players love like as a player no but as a dm my monsters it's just like unless they're fighting a boss monster then i then i roll for like cool attacks like a dragon's breath weapon roll it um which then of course i am counting but usually i don't have like 80 minions going so that's my big thing it's like minions small monsters random encounters all of that average damage let's go This is another one of those things that I think that it's a great idea. I support it. I recommend it, but I probably won't do it myself. But you Um, never do it. Yeah, I never do it myself. But uh, the one thing I will say for for knowing AC ahead of time, excuse me, is that you can do a thing. I I think there is value in uh, setting up tension that way, right? Because I think that when you're in combat, when something dramatic is happening, the moment of release of that tension is when you roll the dice. And if you roll the dice and then you have to do a bunch of maths on top of it, you lose the tension a little bit. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you if you actually do the work ahead of time, you say the AC is 15, you have a bonus of plus seven. So you have to roll, I'm doing the maths, give me a second. You have to roll an eight or higher on the die. Is that correct? I hope so. Anyway, um, you have to roll an eight or higher on the die and then you roll the dice. Then you know immediately when it lands, whether you've hit or not. Right. And I think that there is value in in keeping the tension until that exact moment of release. And that is something that you can only do if you know that those numbers sort of before before the roll comes. When you're revealing things like the DCs for a saving throw or an ability check or an armor class of a monster, to what extent are you influencing the player's decision to even attempt that action in the first place? Right, so, right, right. Um, so for for example, uh, and, I, and I think that this can be a skill that some uh, that all of us can develop over time uh, as we run more games in being able to communicate to players what the difficulty of a task is without tell like tell me it's a DC thirty without telling me it's a DC thirty right mm-hmm. tell me it's a DC twenty like how do you communicate to a player whether the the difficulty of what they're attempting is is an easy check, a medium check, or a hard check using your natu- natural language and set those expectations. And sometimes it can be handy 
if you're actually having trouble communicating to a player how difficult an action is, like, and, and you think, especially if in the fiction, the player would be able to more realistically assess what the danger or the risk of the task is, then it might just be easier for you to say, yeah, um, breaking down this door is a DC 20. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm clearly like, or you can say, you know, this door is reinforced with this material. And so breaking it down is going to be DC 25. And sometimes that can actually add a lot of clarity. And in a weird way, it can actually, by, by putting a number on something, you can actually spark the player's imagination because you're like, oh, I thought this was a rickety wooden door, but now you're telling me it's DC 25 to break it down. So now my imagination is being like, oh, it must be actually this reinforced imposing thing. Mm -hmm. So, and sometimes even just saying to, to a player as well, hey, this monster's AC is 20. You refine that that knowledge of like, now they're imagining the armor plating or the scales or the height of the creature. And the numbers, weirdly enough, actually can function as a descriptive tool for the for the player. So in, once, in a weird way, I want to add once the player is well versed in their mechanical knowledge of the game. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. True. yeah. I, I you, you, absolutely correct. Right. For a player that doesn't have that, that is still new to the game and is still learning what it means for for those to be high or low, it can be a bit a bit dicey in that respect. I want to this this brings up a really good question uh, uh, about a situation that I've found myself in a number of times where uh, my character is facing a combat with a variety of different creatures, uh, none of whom I'm particularly familiar with. And I'm trying to scope out which creature I want to attack. I, I need more information to clear out choice paralysis in combat. And I'll ask my game master uh, what I think the AC of that monster is. Uh, like, <laughs> or, or, you know, go, go a little less mechanically uh, concrete there. Like, how heavily armored is that guy? Uh, post to all of you, do you think in a situation where a player is making it patently obvious that they want to know a hidden value like a DC or AC um, that the GM should just straight up tell them if it's clear, the player wants to know it. I, I do have an interesting hole to poke in this whole discussion actually. And that is uh, the one thing that we need to be careful of as DMs is taking away from what certain classes or subclasses are capable of. Uh -huh. And there is actually the fighter's capability to size up their you're enemy so and ask. You're so true. I mean, you're so right. Or that's I'm so, so true. true. You're, you're so, so true. true. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, but that that is interesting is that if you have, so this is the thing, if you don't have a fighter in your party or like, I, I feel like there's some other options out there that have this ability and nobody in the party has or uses an ability to find out AC, then I, I don't see a problem here. But like in our live stream joe uses the ability and his number one question is always is the ac higher or lower than mine and that's like a clue to the monster as he uses his ability to size it up and if you have a player who is using that ability it is a disservice to that player mm. to just tell the table and take away from their ability that they have uh, so that's just a really interesting side note that just popped into my head um but there you have it no, I agree. That's very interesting. That's a really, um, really good point. And it comes down to the the role of game master as game designer, uh, sort of ad hoc at the table. It's probably reasonable to put it behind a skill check if you wanted to, like a perception check, an insight check, a, a perhaps even one survival? of the knowledge skills, survival, um, maybe even investigation if a player is wanting to determine maybe what the DC of uh, a, a check in the uh, of an ability check in the environment is that could be a reasonable uh, a reasonable thing and and maybe not necessarily stepping on the toes of the battle master fighters attribute I definitely have found uh, when playing sort of controller-esque roles uh, in a party that I don't I I do want to figure out things mm. like okay, Am I looking at a creature with a low wisdom score? Should I be using spells that that call for wisdom saves and trying to figure those things out? But I don't want to be told 
in actuality, actually, they have a very high wisdom score or they have a very low, you know, I don't want to be told necessarily exactly what, what the stats are, the numbers are in that situation. So, I mean, but that, that might just be me, you know, I can't speak for the populace. Mm. <laughs> I I actually do think that uh, the insight check is underutilized in D&D. We actually did a whole video about the insight check being underutilized, but maybe there's value in like, I, I agree as a spellcaster, I get bummed out. Like I've read every monster stat block. Well, maybe not everyone, but I've read a lot of monster stat blocks, but I don't remember them all. And sometimes I mix things up. And also sometimes like Monty will do a description and I still can't determine if this creature is intelligent, wise, or charismatic. And I'm going to cast a spell and then Monty will either be like, yeah, they're immune to that or yeah, they get a plus 20 to their wisdom. And I'm just like, why did I even, and there, there might be value in me in like a player asking as like, an in, like maybe I'm a wizard, an intelligence-based spellcaster. I should have the ability to look at a creature and be like, Monty, judging by what I can see here, do I get a sense that this character is smart or like, and maybe I make an insight check and he's like, you get a feeling that they have like a good head on their shoulder. Uh, they're, they've they're well read, and I'm like, okay, so intelligence is like using insight checks to kind of help the player determine whether their course of action is going to be useful or completely useless. Because nothing's worse than casting a spell, blowing a spell slot, and then the DM goes, "Yeah, they're immune to that," and you go. Oh, I should have known that. Like, I wish there were some clues in the environment or in the monster description mm. to help me know that I shouldn't have used fire against the red dragon. You know, um, <laughs> that one was well, an obvious one, but like check. in in no, my in right. my favorite video game RPG series right now, Persona. Um, there is a very sort of elemental damage typing system, very sort of Pokemon-like. And when it comes to monsters, you kind of have to go based on like aesthetic clues to base, okay, yeah, maybe this angel is weak to like the necrotic element and they and they resist the, the radiant element. Um, but a lot of the times, you know, on... Un unless you've played the game before, you just don't know. And uh, you just kind of need to trial and error, figure out, okay, what is this monster weak to? Because every monster is like a puzzle. It's got a weakness. And if you can mm -hmm. hit that weakness on all the monsters in a fight, you're, you're in fat city. Um, but uh, it's, it's all trial and error up to a point. It's okay in that game because you're controlling one player is controlling five guys with different abilities or four, 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 four characters. Uh, and those turns go by in a snap. In D&D, &D, it's not like that at all. Every person only has one turn. And once they spend that turn, it's likely going to be 15 or 20 minutes before they get another turn again. And so I think you're absolutely right. In a game like D&D, &D, it's important to have ways of knowing the numbers or the, the traits in advance so you can make informed decisions so you can make the most of your single turn per round. And speaking of knowing numbers, I am aware that our time number has been reduced to zero. Oh. And See, that was actually a good segue that you disguised with awkward language. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I, I invite us all to uh, one, Send your questions, and when I say us all, I mean our chat and our audience and our viewers and our <laughs> listeners, of course, to send your questions. If you want them answered in the same sort of uh, thoughtfulness and depth that you just heard here today, send them to podcast at ghostfiregaming.com or leave them in the YouTube comments of this show when it goes up on YouTube. Um, for everyone else, go ahead and sign off. I've been James Hake. Uh, with us also is Dale Kingsmill, Dr. Montgomery Martin, and Kelly McLaughlin. Uh, Monty and Kelly, would you throw down some social media handles for us? Uh, yeah, you can find us on YouTube under Dungeon Dudes, uh, youtube.com slash dungeon underscore dudes. Uh, it's hard to Just remember dungeon where the dudes. underscores are. Just yeah, Dungeon the Dudes, underscore, right? The other one. Yeah. The Twitter. underscores in the Twitter. I Not mean, the YouTube. <laughs> honest, honestly, 
I, I, at this point, if you look up Dungeon Dudes on any social media, you're going to find us. Um, we also have a Twitch stream on Tuesdays. We do have a special Twitch stream this week on Thursday as well. Uh, Twitch.tv slash Dungeon underscore Dudes. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, you can find us specifically on YouTube and also on Patreon. If you do enjoy what Monty and I do and you want to support us, you can join our Patreon. And what the Patreon gets is exclusive access to our Patreon only Discord, where we um, today we did a our monthly writers room where Monty and I actually uh, sit down and chat with a bunch of the people in the Discord about upcoming scripts, ideas. We get ideas from the audience. We also do Q and A's with our Patreon, and we're just in there all the time chatting. People, uh, you know, I, I like to talk yeah. about video games on there, and people love to chat with me about it. So uh, just come hang out with us on Discord if you join our Patreon. And you can also find our Kickstarter at Drakenheim.com. Yes, hey. far be it from us to forget about Sebastian Crow's Guide to Drakenheim in its last handful of days on Kickstarter. Go and back it. Get that apothecary class and its many, many, many unique subclasses. Dale Kingsmill, go ahead and drop your social media for us here too, why don't you? I'm just really pleased that for once I'm not the only person who has a slightly different handle on every platform. <laughs> In this, the age of Google, the easiest way to find me is to type Dale Kingsmill and whatever social platform you're looking for into Google. But largely you can find me on YouTube at Monarchs Factory and on Twitter at Daily Dale. And that's Dale Day, uh, D-A-E-L. Yes, the old English spelling. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, and one last time, follow us on Twitch, ghostfire underscore official. Uh, email us, podcast at ghostfiregaming.com, and check out on YouTube the Ghostfire podcast channel. Subscribe and hit that bell and all the other YouTuber things to say. Hmm. I've been James Hake, <laughs> your host for this week. Next week, we'll have our usual fearless leader, Ben Byrne, back in this seat, and I'll see you then. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Da 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 da